the Lord's Prayer together this morning. Uh, it is found in your pew Bible in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, if you'd like to follow along with us. But would you join me in praying? Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Each week we take up tithes and offerings. Uh, we have a plate in the back and one in the front as well for you to be able to give an offering. And don't forget that we started a new thing last week, which is tremendous, if you ask me. And uh, so, you know, that's just my opinion. But uh, my son attends a church of over 5,000 in downtown Nashville. I stole this idea completely. His pastor and their, their leaders decided they were going to do a dollar offering each week. And what that means is in addition to the offering that you would normally give, whatever that amount that God lays on your heart, that you give one extra dollar per person in your family. So for Jill and Celia and I, we give three extra dollars, one for each of us. And we call that the Eloise offering. And Eloise played our pipe organ for 50 years as a volunteer. And about, you know, I've been here almost three years at this point. And she would come to me when no one was around, and she would walk over to me with her arm like this, and she would slip me a bunch of gift cards for McDonald's to give to the homeless when they came to the door, right? To, to make sure that they were fed, that anybody who came here needing assistance, that we would have that at least to be able to give them, whether we put them up in a, in a place to stay or we got them job training or whatever it might be. But we're calling it the Eloise offering. And by doing that at my son's church, when you have 5,000 people and everybody gives an extra dollar, it's $5,000 a week. And they give that to a different ministry in Nashville each week. So they bless, you know, whether it's the homeless or the battered women's shelter, right? I mean, there's just tons of these ministries that they, they do this for. And that's an incredible amount of money. Well, you know, we're a much smaller congregation, but just think if everybody here participates, then we can give probably 40 to $75, depending on who's here on any particular week, and we can bless somebody with that, right? Some minister here in town uh, that's doing great things for God, um, and, and it would just be a windfall to them. And so each week we would be, we would be able to do that. So that's, that's why that, that's going on. So I hope you'll participate. There is a, a jar in the back um, that you can put your, your cash in. Uh, to be a part of that. And it just goes out. We just we just take it to the to the ministry on Monday or Tuesday, and it's just out to them, and they get it immediately. So, uh, because most of them aren't open on Sunday to be able to do that. Um, okay, so uh, how about praises and prayers at this time? Yes, Colleen? Yeah, praise. Well, Mom's appointment is do not feel like she had a heart attack, so that's wonderful. So they adjusted her medication, and hopefully all will be Dixie did not have a heart attack. Yay. All right, so that's a great answer. There. Anybody else? Praises or prayers? Sam. So uh, Ted actually started the flight back from France on Friday afternoon, and uh, he's landing tonight at eight thirty. Okay. Uh, it's so far been safe travels. I assume he's back in the U.S. by this time. No, you are talking about Ted and Suzanne. He didn't leave her over there, right? Yes. <laughs> you just I said Ted, so. and I was like, I know they're together, so. I, I hope Suzanne. <laughs> All right. I got to look out for Suzanne, make sure she's coming back. All right. Somebody else? So pray for them, but that's also a praise that they, they did get to go to lots of places in the UK, but then also got to go over to France and do some, make some headway in terms of getting the tour into France as well. Anybody else? Praise or prayers? You know, uh, yes, Jimmy. It makes the day go really good when you got whole people. Okay, <laughs> he set the bar high, guys. That's right. Uh, I have. I uh, thank you for that, Jimmy, because I've not mentioned that lately about the adopt a pew. Remember, we did an adopt a pew program where we said, would you just take a pew and try to fill it? Um, try to invite people to come because at least. If you invited 30 people and none of them came, you at least made a difference. You planted a seed that maybe they went to church somewhere else. Maybe they went with their family somewhere. Maybe they'll come at some future time. They didn't show up on the Sunday that you invited them, but you did do something that put them one step closer to being in church. And so I hope that you'll take that seriously and start inviting people to come with you uh, to be a part of that. Anybody else? 
I know Jimmy had uh, skin cancer taken off of his head, and that was a simple thing for him compared to what it could have been. I know he said, I didn't even have to have stitches, right? Isn't that what you said that you told me? So that's a great thing. Maybe I should have had stitches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day, uh, the ability to live it. It's the 24 hours that we've been promised is this February 19th. And Lord, we just ask that our words and actions would be pleasing to you today and that they produce fruit for you, that they grow your kingdom, that, that, that we're about your business today, serving you wholeheartedly. We ask that we give you praise for so many different things and answers to prayer like Miss Dixie uh, not having a heart attack, Lord. And, and um, we just thank you so much for you listening and hearing our prayers that you have called us faithfully to pray without ceasing. And, and Lord, thank you for the revivals that are going on in our country, um, especially at Asbury, which is uh, the seminary where uh, Bob and Myrtle's daughter, Lori, just graduated from back in May. And um, that it's just a tremendous revival. There, there are people waiting uh, to get in, and if the line goes all the way down the block and around the corner uh, just to get in there. And I know I have a friend that attends Lee University in Cleveland, and they're having the same thing going on at their school as well. Um, I'm just excited about the revival that is coming in our country. Um, Lord, we lift up to you our prayer requests. You know, we have pages of folks that we're praying for um, who have serious health issues, and we ask that you would bring healing, um, just as you did in the Bible, just as you did uh, in, in our lives that we have seen over and over, the miracles, signs, and wonders that you do. And Lord, we uh, invite you into this service. We ask that you would um, bless those that, whose marriages are struggling, who are struggling financially, who are struggling for work, um, struggling with their kids. We ask for healing in all those situations. Um, Lord, give us godly Christian leaders in our country. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, the kids can come forward for our kids' message. Hi, Journey. It's so good you're here. Glad you're here today. Always good to see you. And Elijah's back today. Hi, Nora. Hi, now, how come you people can't be that excited about going to church? Come on. That's enthusiasm right there. Can you imagine James Myers running in like that next week? It'd be great. It'd be awesome. All right. So, um, I want to tell you a little bit. Hi, Miss Lucille. Good to see you, too. Um, we are, uh, we're, we're, we're at the point where we're going to talk about Elijah today. Not him, not that Elijah, but who he's named after, right, in the Bible. And I want to tell you because it's such good stories about, I want us to always know that God will take care of us no matter what. God will take care of our every need. And this is kind of a weird story, but it is, it gets to the point of that God really will provide whatever we need in any given moment. So God was upset with the Israelites and he said, it's not going to rain for a while and I'll cause a drought and a drought will cause a famine. There won't be a bunch of food around um, and it's to teach them a lesson because they had a lot of sin in their lives. And so he tells Elijah, this is going to happen. Go tell the king. And Elijah does that. And then. So for us, we tend to think that that means that God's people, the ones that are being obedient, don't have to go through those kind of things. And yet they do. They still have to go through the famines. They still have to go through the droughts and all of that, along with the people who sinned and um, still be able to give God praise. Right. So here he is. And God says, go out and live in the wilderness. Now, Mr. Randy and I will go hunting from time to time, much like Baker and your dad do. Right. And he, he takes me out to the wilderness. I mean, it's the wilderness where we go. And it's in East Tennessee. But, um, you know, there's lots of banjo music playing when we get there. It's, it's kind of a crazy place. And so we go out there, and when you sit there and you don't talk, it's the most quiet place. I mean, you can't hear anything. And you might hear the stream right beside you just barely going by. That might be what you hear. But we go out in the wilderness, and I'm going to be honest. Mr. Randy, if he went and lived in the wilderness, he would live because he could shoot all kinds of stuff and he'd have plenty to eat and all that. You know, he, can, he even knows how to cook it. He knows how to, you know, all that. Miss Leah's grew up on a farm. They could cook vegetables, all that. They'd be fine. If I got left out in the wilderness, I would starve to death. I'm just telling you right now because I can't hit the broad side of a barn, okay, in terms of shooting something. So here we are, and he tells him to go out in the wilderness. So you have to imagine, is Elijah one of those guys like Mr. Randy or is he like me? Is he a preacher? Got soft hands, right? Never worked a hard day in his life, that kind of thing, right? And so 
here he is, he goes out in the wilderness, and he's sitting there, and I imagine that he's praying, right? Because he's all by himself, and he's probably twiddling his thumbs like this, not knowing what to do. And he goes, Lord, um, it's about to get dinner time. And the Lord speaks to him, and he says, I have built this McDonald's here for you to have food. No, that's not what he says in the Bible. He doesn't say that at all. What it does say is God said, okay, see, there's a brook right over there, and you can get all the clean water, it's fresh water, all the water you need to drink is right there. Selah's real good. She drinks water every meal, all, all that kind of stuff. So then he goes, well, that's great that there's water, Lord, and I sure appreciate it because you can't live three days without water, right? He said, what about food, Lord? And God said, I'll provide. Don't you worry. I've worked out a deal with the ravens. The Baltimore Ravens? No. Well, what ravens is he talking about? Lord, what, what are we talking about here? And he says, oh, the birds. I've worked out a deal with the birds. Now, we have ravens that sit on top of our steeple here at the church, right? Those big black birds that sit up there. And um, God says, they're going to bring you meat and bread in the morning and meat and bread in the evening. Now, Ellie, if you go to school and you tell the teacher you need to go outside because the ravens are going to deliver your lunch before you time to eat, right? They're going to think you're crazy, right? The birds are going to drop me some food. That's why I got to go outside. Can you imagine? He goes out and he's standing there going, birds are going to drop me meat and bread. So this bird's going to drive by and drop me a Subway sandwich right in my hands, right? Every day in the morning and in the evening. Now, I have, uh, have you ever tried to shoo birds away? Have you ever gone out in your yard and go, get out here, birds, leave, come on, shoot, shoot. They, they kind of get off the ground about two feet and then they go sit down again. Or they fly up in a tree and sit there and go, ah, ah, at you or whatever, right? They don't listen to what we say. And yet they listen to God. And every morning and every evening, the birds came and dropped bread and meat to Elijah. And he had the water from the brook to drink. And God provided for him for over a year. Provided for him that way. He had food to eat. Now some of us would go, gross, that's disgusting. Birds dropping that to him, right? We, don't, we weren't there. We don't have a clue, right? We, we, we don't have an idea of what it was like or how God did it. But we know that God doesn't do gross stuff like you know certain things to take care of us. And yet his needs were met and he was full is the word that the Bible uses. He ate all he wanted. And so I want you guys to know that no matter what the circumstances are, no, no matter what else is going on around us, that God will take care of each of us in whatever we need. He'll meet our needs. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for these guys. And I, I ask your blessing on them and on their children's church time. I want them to understand that God is in their corner and will take care of them in every situation, no matter what it is, Lord. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go to children's church today. I'm Miss Lucille. Joe. You did so good today. I was a great job. We win this! us to eat with him, to dine with him. There's that parable of going out and uh, the guy sends everybody out and says, go, compel them to come in to feast at the table. And yeah, it's amazing that we get to dine with God.
and how we are supposed to do things together. And so uh, I actually have, have been blessed in my ministry uh, because uh, I have, from day one, been able to do mission trips with youth and, you know, retreats and camps and those kind of things. And from the very first, when I went into the ministry and started work at the Tusculum Church, uh, they had already planned a beach trip that first year. And so I couldn't switch that up. It wasn't in my uh, ability to be able to do that. They had already had it all planned and everything. And so I took them and we went. And the next year I said, that was great. I had a lot of fun at the beach trip. We learned a lot, grew in our Bible studies, all that. But next year we're going to work on our mission trip. We're going to do that as part of this. And we took them to Bethel Farm Workers Ministry in Tampa, right outside, which is a Cumberland Presbyterian mission there. And uh, everybody was, didn't know what to expect. It was the very first one that we'd ever done. First one that I'd ever done. And we were going to be gone a week and stay in inland in Wimalba, Florida, um, and uh, near Plant City. And so we go pulling up the first day to work, and the lady goes, we're so excited that you guys are here. We have, we're just feel like we're just barely keeping our head above water because we have so many donations, so much stuff, activity, but we don't have enough people to make it work. So we need you guys to really help us this week. And we said, great, be glad to do whatever you want. And it's at that point that I learned we'll do whatever you don't want to do or you can't get people to do. Let us help you that way. And so we walked in and she opened the door to this room and she swung it open. And it was a room probably half the size of this room, and it was full of boxes, cardboard boxes. And I said, what's this room? She goes, our storage room. And I went, oh, okay, what are you storing? And she goes, well, it's donations to the, to the ministry. And I was like, donations of what? She goes, mostly clothes. And I said, well, how long have they been here? And she goes, well, some of them just came in last week, but others probably three years, five, two years, uh, uh, four, four years. Uh, I was like... These boxes have been sitting here for three or four years. And she goes, yeah, we just don't have anybody to unbox them and get them out. She goes, it's clothing that people need. And we just kind of dig in the first few boxes to get out what we need sometimes. But all of this other stuff, and I mean, it was just hundreds of boxes. And so we walked in, and I'm trying to explain to the youth, this is what we're going to be doing. I've got adult volunteer chaperones that are standing around. And I said, we're going to, this is what we're going to be doing this week. We're indoors. I said, we're in, you know, it was kind of air conditioned, sort of. It was still out of the 100 degree heat. And I said, this is what we're going to be doing all day. And the one adult chaperone said, okay, this is what we're going to do. And she opened up the box. She reached in and there was a sleeve laying right there. And she picked up the sleeve and the clothes came out in a square. <laughs> That's how long they had been in the box. They were stuck together. Um, and, and she went, oh my goodness. And the lady goes, don't worry. We've got two washers, two dryers. We can, whatever we need to wash, we can wash and then get it done. And so we did laundry for five days of going through all of these hundreds of boxes. They brought us lots of hangers and we hung them on racks and everything uh, to get it to where here's our kids' stuff, here's our women's stuff, here's our men's stuff. Kind of like, you know, Heidi, you'll walk in over there and she and Patsy and Myrtle and all them, they'll all be over there sorting for the yard sale, getting everything so you can figure out where to look for what it is that you need. That kind of stuff. But it was, you'd pull it out and the bugs would go and run like that. It would be some of it wet, some of it would be molded, some of it would be, you know, whatever. And that's what we did for the week. Now, in saying that, the really cool thing to me is, is that the disciples went and did stuff. And a lot of times, it wasn't very fun, the places they were going. Jesus had been crucified, and so they actually, when they would go to places, there was risk to their lives. There was... The places they were staying weren't, it wasn't like they were staying at the Four Seasons. Uh, they might be going days without eating, all of those kind of things. And when you go on a mission trip, you have a lot of that. But one of the cool things is, is you get to know everybody that's on the trip and you bond together. You really make inroads and you guys have taken mission trips to different places like the Children's Home in Denton, Texas. And so you really build relationships during that time. So for us in chapter 9, it becomes important to build relationships because we have to have people in our lives who are sharing the gospel with us, showing us how to grow in our faith, sending us out, praying for us, all of those wonderful things, and because life is not worth living without those things. So let's look here. If we look at chapter 9, verse 1, 
It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the, into the city and you'll be told what you must do. This is Saul's conversion. And for us, the first step for us in this whole thing, I'm, I'm giving you something that will change your life that will transform the way that you live here in Columbia, Tennessee, Spring Hill, wherever it is that you live, this will transform. If you put these things into practice and you do these things, Knoxville, Tennessee, even for Randy and Leah, um, this is something that will change you. Is that the first step in this is that we've got to stop judging people whether they're good enough or not. We've got to get to the point where no matter how ugly, nasty, right? I shared one night here that, that there was a lady. I, I was in a parking lot in Franklin, and she it was pouring down rain, and I came out of a thrift store, which you guys know I'm in thrift stores quite a bit. And so I came out of this thrift store in the pouring down rain at night. I walk, in, walk into the parking lot, take two steps, and this lady runs through the red light, comes down and slides into the parking lot right up next to me like this because she was going so fast. And I went like that. And I said, and she rolled her window down a little bit, and I said, five miles an hour in the parking lot. And at that point, it was on. She rolled down the window, and she cussed me all the way to my car, followed me with her car to my car, screaming and yelling obscenities at me and telling me what a terrible awful person I was in the middle of pouring down rain while she's in the dry car. And so in the midst of that, then we have the opportunity when confronted like that to say, you're not worthy. I'm not telling you about Jesus. I don't want to see you in heaven. I'd like an animal to drop on your head, right? I mean, that's what we, we get to, right? I'd like to see you hit by a bus as opposed to you getting saved and baptized. Paul was persecuting Christians and had actually stood holding the coats while they stoned Stephen, who was one of the prominent disciples. That was the guy. And you just heard that he had gone and he's dragging people out of their homes and arresting them and having them beaten and tortured for their faith. This is the guy that Jesus decides is going to be my worker, my servant. And so he gets blinded on the road to Damascus. Now let me show you what your part is in this. My part is in this. It says, if we skip down just a little bit further, look at, uh, at verse 9. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Talking about Saul, who will be Paul before long. It says, in Damascus... There was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, exclamation mark. How many of y'all have ever had a vision? And I mean a real vision. I mean, I'm not talking about uh, Catherine saying, I've got a vision for the Cullioka girls basketball team. I want to win a championship. That's a vision, right? But I'm talking about a vision, vision. We don't raise our hands right now because you'd say, somebody think I'm crazy to say that I had a vision, right? Um, but here's Ananias, and he has such a relationship with God and it doesn't mean that he was born under some special sign, that his dad was so-and-so, his mom was so-and-so, that he was born in this particular city. It just means that he had a relationship where he talked to God and God talked to him. That's all that it means. And for us, when I say we need to have a daily relationship with Christ, that's what I'm talking about. We need to expect God to answer. Now, sometimes he answers through, um, you know, James Myers or Sam Kislow or Margie Owens, right? Sometimes he answers through his people. He answers through his word, the Bible. Sometimes he answers through uh, nature. Sometimes he answers through angels appearing to us. But sometimes he does visions. And this is, Ananias is hearing this. And it says, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, I'm in verse 11, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's coming here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, exclamation mark. That's our second action step. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Notice verse 17. Then Ananias went, that's obedience, to the house and entered it. 
placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me point out something to you that's interesting. They didn't have a conversation beforehand. He comes in and he tells Saul, I'm here because you were blinded on the road to Damascus and when Jesus talked to you. That's not information that Saul shared with him. He has that information from God. It's information that he only could have gotten from God. And he shares it. Again, that's another miracle. It says, uh, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see him and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So because of what we've just seen, number one, his blindness was healed because Ananias laid hands on him. And then number two, he became a Christian and was baptized in the midst of all of that. I want you to see that this is going on and this transformation that's happening in his life is all about God's people going and connecting with him and with others. If we keep reading just a little bit more, it says Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this a man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on the name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Notice this. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch. Notice, what was that word? It said Saul learned of their plan, right? But then the next word, day and night, they, that's plural, kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. That's the Jews. But his followers, that's, that's Christians that are now following Paul, Saul. It says, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall, saving his life. Did you hear that? This is, I mean, it wasn't that he went... Or that he went and then he was magically whisked away somewhere else. He needed someone else's help to lower him in a basket to save his life and let his ministry continue. I want you to see that, that it's, it's important as far as this, the number of people and the touches that are there. The number of folks that come together. If we keep reading, it says when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Barnabas taking him and easing the tensions, bringing peace between him and the, the apostles. He, he's actually bringing him in as one of the, hey, you're one of the group. You're, one, you're accepted now. He, he smooths that over, and he's in the midst of, of Paul being accepted by this group of people. If we keep reading just a little bit further, it says, um, verse 29, he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Again, these believers rescuing him and getting him out and sending him along somewhere else. That you're somebody caring for his needs, meeting his needs, uh, that's there. I tell you this because um, for us, you have to understand the connectedness of ministry. That we, every single person sitting here, where the reason you're sitting here is because somebody invested in you. Somebody touched your life. Now, I'm not saying that it wasn't God, because it was. God drew you with his Holy Spirit, no doubt about it whatsoever. But somebody invited you, befriended you, brought you, whatever it might be. It might have been your mom and dad, might have been a friend, might have been a neighbor. But they made sure to get you to the Lord, and then he worked on your heart, and then there was repentance, and you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, right? That is what went on. Well, the thing we need to notice is, is that then in turn, we're supposed to invest in other people. There is a connectedness. And so, you know, when people come, let's imagine uh, we had visitors over the last few weeks. Is that when a visitor is here, I hope that you go over and introduce yourself to them. That you talk to them. That you say, thank you for being here. Because that's that first bit of investment. Is that they just want to come to this church like you come to this church. Or if they come on Wednesday night, whatever it might be. 
And we have to figure out, okay, so if I'm going to invest in somebody's life, what am I known for? Well, there's, there's stuff that I call that's not investment. We're, we're not there to cut people down. We're not there to judge people. We're not there to be, you know, a negative influence in their life. When they come to this church, what we hope to do is draw them closer, push them further along the road, lead them further along the road to Jesus so they have a greater relationship with him. That's the kind of investment we're hoping to have. Now, for us, one of the cool things to me is that um, I only know Randy and Leah because someone invested. Let me, let me show you this because I want you to see how churches are built. Okay? So a lady named Elizabeth McDaniel, I went to church with her. And I talked to her and she was, she was a person who was a realtor. And she had a walk with Christ and it was just basic. And over the course of a period of time, she grew in her faith and I said, Elizabeth, would you teach junior high Sunday school? And she went, oh my goodness, no, no, I do not want to teach junior high Sunday school. That's like the first level of hell, right? I don't want to do that, right? And I said, um, I, I don't have anybody. I desperately need somebody. I went, please. You know, I mean, it was that arm twist and guilt. Anything I could use to try to get her because I didn't have anybody. And she goes, I'll try for a little while. I said, okay. She taught it, and over the next year, at the end of it, she was smiling, and everybody in that class loved her, and she came to me and grabbed me by the arm after church one Sunday and said, man, I am so glad that I've done this. I've had to study so hard to answer all those junior high questions. I really know the Bible, and I've grown in my faith, and I talk to God every day now, and, and I mean, there was this really good moment. She worked with a woman named Christy, and she invited Christy to come to church. And Christy said, eh, you know, I don't know, I'm at maybe, maybe. She had four kids of her own, uh, and, um, and, and she's three kids, three kids of her. And she, uh, she said, okay, we'll come and we'll visit. She came and visited, and that's the lady I told you all about who brought 48 people to the church uh, over the course of the time that I was there by herself, inviting people to come. Um, but, oh, by the way, her daughter, Christy's daughter, um, named Tabitha, she came and she started coming to youth group. And then she invited her good friend, Emily Atchley, their daughter, to come to youth group. And so she started coming to youth group. And then Randy and Leah started coming to church. And then I met uh, some people that worked for them named TJ and Jen. And they came to church. That, I mean, they've been elders. We're talking about people that have been elders in the church that I serve. And TJ and his wife came into the church. And then Bill and Catherine came into the church. And our church did this number as it connected and invested in people. I want you to see that. It's not this. It's not that Chris gets up here with such wise and persuasive words that it just amazingly draws people in. He's so funny. He's so, you know, whatever it might be, that's not how you grow a church. Because there's always somebody that tells better stories. There's always somebody that's funnier. There's always somebody that knows the Bible better. It's about connection. It is about investing in us, taking the time. And the word that you're looking for, is loving people enough that you take the time to get to know them, invest in them, invite them. That's what you have to do. And so here we are. And on the next mission trip that we went on at, at Tusculum, we had met some people along the way. And one of the families that we had met and his, he had started coming to the youth group was a boy named Donnie. And Donnie had three brothers and sisters. There were four kids. And the dad had left them, and the mom was working her fingers to the bone, two eight-hour-a-day jobs. She worked 16 hours every single day to put food on the table for her four kids. Her kids were now, like, two in middle school, two in high school, and they were there basically alone raising themselves because she had no family for support, and they were not involved in a church. And so our church kind of took them in as a family and loved on them, and Donnie signed up to go on our mission trip that next year. And he was going to go, and... and his family, you know, they had stuff where like the, the truant officer would be at their house all the time because their mother was at work. She couldn't wake them up in the morning and get them ready for school and give them breakfast and everything that you guys do. Myrtle drove to school, right? Um, you, you know, it's, they'd have to get up on their own. Well, they didn't often get up on their own. They just skipped school. And so the truant officer would be there. They had nobody that was really, she was, she was doing everything she could to provide for them. And so we're saying, okay, there's this mission trip coming up. We need you to fill out these forms. And she was real good. She did all that stuff. And, and he was so excited about going. And the day that we were supposed to leave, we're like, everybody meet at the church, 6 a.m. We're going to get on the bus, load up all of our luggage, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we're going to go. Got to schedule. We got to be here. We got to be here. We got to be here. Right? 
We planned everything out to the last detail, done all the fundraisers, had all the chaperones, everything. Everybody's ready to go. 6 a.m., we get to the church, we load up the bus, we get everybody on there, everybody's excited. Everybody goes, where's Donnie? No Donnie. 6.15, no Donnie. 6.20, no Donnie. And I'm going, no cell phones. So call over there, ring, 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 nothing. And here, standing here with the adults, and what's the conversation that goes on among the adults? It's not a bad conversation, it's just a conversation. Let's just go. Just leave him. He, he, you know, just, just, it's, something happened. I don't know what it was. So, you know how it is with them. Something happened. Let's just go. And I said, no, we're not going to go. And they're like, we're not going on the mission trip. I go, no, we're going to Donnie's house. And I took the whole caravan. We drove over to their neighborhood. We pulled up in front of their house and went and knocked on the door. What did I get? Teenage girl going, what? What's going on? I went, we're leaving on the mission trip. Where's Donnie? Is that today? I was like, yeah, it's today. We go in. Donnie is, I mean, just sawn logs. He's got these, he's in the covers. He's in his jammies. You know, he's got like Buzz Lightyear jammies on. He's like, he's sitting over there saying, I go, Donnie. He's like, what? what? He's put his glasses on. And I was like, are you going on the mission trip? And he goes, is that today? And, and I was like, yeah, are you packed? No. Because his mom's not there to help him pack, right? And so we stayed there for an hour packing him up, gathering everything. I said, well, buy the rest at Walmart. Throw it in the suitcase. Let's go. Let's get on the bus. He came out, sat down on the bus, and everybody went, Donnie, so glad you're here, man. It's awesome. I'm glad. And we go on the mission trip, and it's unbelievable. He gets bonded with these kids, and, and he has this, this wonderful time. And I'm sitting there thinking about that, and I go, how committed are we to people? Now, we're committed to our kids. Golly, Jill and I have... We, we've driven more miles. We, we should get some kind of award for taxi service, right? And driving four kids to all their practices and concerts and band things, and, right? All those things that you go to, um, mission trips, retreats, camps, all that. Um, but how committed are we to other people? Because Ananias, God said, I need you to go lay hands on Saul. Oh, you want me to choke him out during the middle of the night, Lord? No, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to lay hands on him so he'll be healed and he's going to be a disciple. No, that's all. That's all. We don't want him. No, we don't want him getting saved. That's, you, you know, hit him with a bus. Get him stepped on by camp, Lord. Let that happen, please. Right? No, but he goes and lays hands on him and he's healed. And then did you see what happened from that point on? Is that from that point on, Paul is a different person who's transformed. And I'm not saying he's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying that he saw that. It was his goal, his role in life was then to proclaim the word of God city to city, town to town, person to person. And so for us, we're at the point where we're sitting here and we go, okay, so what is it that I'm supposed to be about? What is it that I'm supposed to do? And we start off with that prayer and fasting thing and then we're waiting on God to speak to us. We're waiting on God to show us what to do. And he will present things to us. It'll be, Sam always cracks me up. Because I'll go, how'd you choose the song to sing this week or whatever? He'll go, well, you mentioned it on Sunday. And then Jerry said something to me about it on Tuesday. Then I heard on the radio on Wednesday. Then on Thursday, Ted called me and said, you know, and it all just that. And that's the way God does sometimes. Sometimes he just goes, do this. Sometimes he, he makes it obvious to us. And so he speaks to us. He gives us that idea. And then it's up to us to go with that. That's the part of going. He lays people on our hearts in those situations. So for me, um, you know, when you start talking about doing a mission trip, and we didn't have to do that at all, but it starts with an idea that turns into having to do fundraisers. You have to do learn to drive a van or a bus. You take your own personal vehicle sometimes. You sleep on the floor in air mattresses if you've got them. Um, you cook group meals, and you buy all the groceries, plan the menus, and all that. Remember what everybody's allergies are and what they don't eat, all those kind of things. Teach Bible studies, you work hard, you plan and you communicate with people, uh, you listen to the whining and complaining, you put up with the smells of the people after they've worked all day, um, and you play hard, you go see fireworks and go to theme parks, um, you plan a banquet usually at the end, and you endure the hot days and the hard work. Let me say this, the commitment that you make if you're an adult and going on one of those things, is that you get up like at six in the morning and we do like a short quiet time, just go pray and read our Bibles. Then you get breakfast ready for everybody. You make sure you got all the tools and everything necessary for the day, the supplies that you're gonna need. Um, 
you wake up kids who are grouchy and grumpy, get them up and fed, get them dressed and on the buses, um, and you take them out where you've planned out activities for them for the day, always in the heat. Everyone I've ever been to, we've been somewhere where it's been hot, and we've worked for the day. And then when you come back is you have to go and either at night when everybody's in bed or while part of the time while they're working and go buy all the groceries and plan the meal and cook the meal with a group of kids and get that ready. And then um, at night, then you go and you teach a Bible study, you play games, you have music that somebody's prepared that you got somebody that you pulled in for. And then you do kind of a cabin time where you lay around till 1230 or one o'clock while kids talk about the issues that they have and kind of joke around with each other, talk about their faith. And then you get up and you do the same thing the next day. And you do that for maybe seven days, nine days, depending on where you go. It takes a great deal of commitment to live that kind of investment in somebody's lives. We took a group. We went to Wilmington, North Carolina. We worked all week for Habitat for Humanity. I was worn out. We were putting in doors and windows, putting in baseboards in this house. No ventilation, no air conditioning. And we took some really great people with us. We, we were there with Ron and Margie Jones. Um, I'm sorry, Ron and Margie. Sorry about that. Ron and Mary Jones. And uh, we were there with Susan Overton and Tom uh, Davis Overton. And then Jill and myself were there. Worked like dogs all week in the heat. And at the end of the week, we had planned to take the kids to Cape Hatteras. And so... We actually left after work on Friday. Everybody's still kind of grubby. And we drove up to Camp Lejeune and took the ferry across to Ocracoke Island. Anybody here ever been on that ferry? It's about, it's over an hour long. And we're on this ferry with our vehicles. We're sitting and I'm just looking out and the sun is kind of setting over the ocean and over the bay. And it was incredible. It was unbelievable. Kids still, when I see them today, go, Remember that ride to Ocracoke and what an amazing that was? And I went, yeah, we just sat there and soaked in God. It was just unbelievable. And then we got over to Ocracoke and there was a restaurant. We'd made a reservation to go in, just a regular restaurant. Because when you have 30 people, you have to call McDonald's ahead of time and tell them you're coming, right? And so we go into a restaurant and we sit down and we have a meal together. We get up, we're finished with the meal. And the guy says, where are you going from this point? I said, oh, we're going to Cape Hatteras. We have to catch the next ferry across. And he goes, you do realize the next ferry leave, the last ferry leaves in about 20 minutes. And I went, um, no, it said that there was one at such and such and such. He goes, no, they're not doing that anymore. And I went, oh, holy cow. So we all jump in and we speed to this ferry. And now it's pitch dark and I've got three vehicles. And we're come rushing up to this ferry, which is looks like a tugboat. And we get pulled right up to it and he goes, it's full. And I went, um, you don't understand. I have to get to Hatteras. That's where the place to stay is. It's on Hatteras. And he goes, well, you should have thought about that beforehand. I said, um, I, I, and so I turn around and my adults are there and they're like, what's going on? And I said, they don't have room for us. And they said, well, let's pray. And we prayed. And the guy goes, hang on. And he has every car, everybody get in their cars and just inch them forward, three or four or five, six inches, eight inches, nine inches. And we pulled the first van in, kind of over here. And then everybody kind of pulled a little bit more. We got the second van in, and then a little bit more. And we're all, I mean, the cars are up against each other. And it's, we're just, and the third vehicle gets on there. And I went, oh, thank you, Jesus. And I don't know, I'll do anything you want to do. Thank you so much, Jesus. You know, that kind of thing. And we take that night ferry across to Cape Hatteras. And the next day we were at the lighthouse. And we go up to Kitty Hawk. And we see five lighthouses. And man alive. I mean, the kids' eyes are like this big, and they're like, I've never experienced anything like this before. It's been such an awesome week. I'm glad that I got to go. We turn to come home, and we stop at a church like this. Just pulled off the road. It was time for church. We go in. We doubled their attendance. There was, there was that few people in there. And those people's faces lit up, and it was like 4th of July, and a guy was singing, I'm proud to be an American, to Lee Greenwood or whatever. He says, from, what was it, the, the, the hills of from the hills of Tennessee, and all of our kids went, woo, you know, that kind of thing, you know, that number, and uh, during church, and they were like, you know, uh, and, but they said, why did you stop here? And I said, well, I just, this is where God told me to go, I just pulled off, and then there you were, and then, and they said, thank you so much. It, it was an unbelievable Sunday. And it's good to see children that are this on fire for the Lord. 
I tell you all of that because I would have never experienced any of that if I hadn't started investing in that first kid. If I hadn't started investing in that first adult, that might be a possibility to go on a mission trip as a chaperone. And when you start that investing, then it connects you to somebody who then connects you to somebody else who then connects you to somebody else. And the Holy Spirit works in the midst of that. And you see this amazing fruit produced in your life. And you see people who see the world in a completely different way. And you see kids' lives transformed, adult lives transformed. And then you see churches that are on fire for the Lord. But we have to make that initial investment. We have to be willing to step out and do that. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I thank you so much um, that you are uh, at work in our lives. Uh, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is moving in our midst. I thank you that you are calling us to greater things. You have a calling on each of our lives. You have a specific purpose and plan for each of us. And Lord, it doesn't matter if we're 10 years old, 30 years old, 80 years old. You still have a plan for us. You have a purpose for us. And it may just be one person you want us to reach. It may be by reaching that one person, as Lottie Moon did, that 10,000 people came to know the Lord because of the preaching of that one person that you reach. Lord, I pray that we would see the possibilities and that we would be willing to invest in people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As Sam leads us in our, our song, our altar area is open to you to come and to pray, to join the church, to get saved, maybe to know Jesus for the first time. Maybe it's just to pray about um, whatever situation is going on with you your life right now. Maybe you want to play for, pray for our government or pray for the revival. Whatever it is, will you come as we stand and sing together?
just for a minute. I have to tell you, when I, when I meet heroes, then I have to tell you about them. Uh, Leah went on a mission trip with us. You know, my wife is a hero. She's been on basically all 23 of them with me. Um, but Leah went with us to uh, the low country of Charleston to do work with Habitat for Humanity. And they don't tell you when, before you get there what you're going to do, usually because they're afraid it'll run you off. Um, but each group, we had different places we're going to be working. And Leah's group, they said, we need your help over here in this uh, extreme build that we're doing. We're building a bunch of houses all at once. We need your help over there. And she goes, okay, what are we going to be doing? And they said, installing insulation. And mm -hmm. she goes, okay. And so you think, oh, we're going to be in a hot attic, but you know, whatever. And they said, no, 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 we're putting insulation underneath the floors. And so you're going to have to lay on your back and it's only about this high underneath there. Um, and be careful of the snakes and the, and the spiders and all that kind of stuff. And you're going to have to scoot yourself back on your back, back up underneath there, and then put it from the very back corners, you know, putting this insulation, this, this barrier underneath there in this house. And the kids that were assigned with Leah were all like, <laughs> we're doing what? Right? And Leah took them out there, and they worked like champs. I mean, she, she motivated them, and they did all this great work. I tell you that because she volunteered to go on that trip. She had a kid that was going as well, but she volunteered to go and she was there. And one night, it was probably next to the last night we were there, I asked the group, I want you to pray. And I know that God will answer you, but I want you to pray and ask God to speak to you. Put something on your heart so that you can tell us what it is or whatever. So Jill, we did this prayer time and Jill goes, um, I'm sorry, but all that I have in my head is a is a dress, this really loud dress, this really wild pattern on this dress. I don't, that's all I got. I'm not sure that's from the Lord. I think it must have been the barbecue I ate earlier or whatever. You know, I don't know what that means. And I said, well, you know, if it's from the Lord, he'll reveal it to you or whatever. So we go the next day and it's the hottest day of the week. It's rained a little bit and we go and Leah and them are all underneath the house. We're doing all of our stuff with shovels that we were where we were working and all that. And we all look like homeless children, right? I mean, we're, we're covered in dirt. And so I said, I'm going to bless you. I'm taking you over here to the, the Sunoco, whatever it is, the Sunoco, and I'm going to get you all an icy, you know, finish up here. We're all going to get a big one of those frozen drinks. So we stop and we go in and the kids are like, Chris, you're the greatest guy ever. You know, I mean, we're stopping over there and they're <laughs> Just, we're all standing in there and everybody's just looking at us like, where have they been? They're filthy. And so Jill is sitting there and she's going, and she's looking out the window and she goes, hold this. And I went, what? And she goes marching out and there's somebody pumping gas. There's like lots of people pumping gas. And she goes over and there's an African-American lady and she's standing there and she's putting her card in and she's getting her thing. And she has on this dress that is wild. The print on it is just wild. And I went, and Jill walked up to her and she goes, ma'am, I know this is going to sound really weird, but I had a dream a vision from God last night and your dress was there. It was, it, it's the exact same one. Is there some reason that God would want you and I to talk today? Is there anything that I can do for you to pray with you or whatever? I don't mean to seem weird or anything like that. And the lady goes, and she walked around on the other side of the car and her husband rolled down the window. And what did he had just had done at the, at the hospital? Like amputations. He had a leg amputated at the hospital. And he was praying when he left the hospital, Lord, I don't know if I can go on. Lord, I don't know if I, this is overwhelming to me. You're going to have to give me somebody. You're going to have to give me something to show me that you're in the middle of this and that you're, you're there for me or whatever. And the lady said, and Jill went around there and Jill said, I just want to pray for you. And, and he goes, and the tears just come all over. He goes, God is real. God is good. God has sent you here to pray with me today. And she shared that with our whole group. And I mean, kids' eyes are just crying and stuff. Because for them, they're always looking for, hey, I want to know that God is real. I don't, want to, I don't want to be led astray. I want to know that God is active in this world, that he still loves me, and that he still... And it's all about those investments. And if Leah hadn't volunteered to go, she wouldn't have been there to see God move like that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. And... Um, Lord, I thank you that you are at work in this world in so many different places that every single day that you are uh, sitting in that chair beside the fire place at our house, that you're waiting to have a conversation with us. You're waiting for us to read the Bible and to pray. You're waiting to spend that time with us. And Lord, help us to be committed to that. And Lord, use us, empower us, uh, give us the vision for where you want us to go and who you want us. Put people in our paths, make divine appointments for us. 
And uh, Lord, help us to answer those. Help us to invest in the people that you put in our path. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.